Well, hello. This is a talk about creation. It's primarily for Christadelphians, so it does assume a knowledge of their beliefs and engages with some of their material. If you're not Christadelphian, welcome along, and I hope you find this talk useful. This is the fourth talk under the general heading, Creation for Christadelphians. In the first talk, we showed that the beginning in Genesis 1 refers to the six days of creation. And secondly, that only God can create. In the second talk, we saw that for there to be life, God has to give it. In the third talk, we discussed the vantage point from which Genesis 1 was written. In this talk, we consider the use of numbers in Genesis 1, and then move on to talk about the related topic of time in Genesis 1. First then, let's consider numbers in Genesis 1. The numbers 1 through to 6 are all found in Genesis 1. Of these, the numbers 1 and 2 each occur twice. The numbers can be divided into two groups. There are three instances of cardinal numbers, that is, numbers which tell how many there are of a certain thing. As we will see later, the Hebrew ended first in Genesis 1 verse 5 in the AV should uh, most likely be translated 1. The second type of numbers are ordinal, that is, they indicate the order of a given thing. There are five of these. Before looking at these specific numbers in Genesis 1, it is worth reflecting generally on numbers and mathematics with regard to God. God's at the very foundation of mathematics. As a starting point, any account of the basis of mathematics must acknowledge that it is axiomatic that God is. Furthermore, the Bible says that God is one. And given that God is from everlasting to everlasting and does not change, the number one has always had an application, at the very least, to God himself. In Phanerosis, Brother Thomas talks about numbers in relation to God. His prime concern is to use arithmetic to illustrate God manifestation. But what he writes is useful for considering mathematics itself. Concerning God manifestation, he says, the Father's spirit is embodied power. Paternal power implies offspring or children, children or sons of power. Son power is also embodied power. It is power emanating from the Father, corporealized in one or a multitude, but never separated or detached from the focal center. The Son power is therefore the Father power, multitudinously expressed, manifested through many bodies. This is illustrated in the science of arithmetic. He then goes on to talk about numbers with regard to the importance of the number one. Arithmetic is the science of numbers. The hypostasis or basis of the science is a multitudinous expression of one, a multiplication of number one. Let there be no numerical power called one, and there could be no five, 50, or any other combination of one. One is the great power of the ar arithmetical universe, and all the other powers resulting from the multiplication of one combined cannot exclude one therefrom without annihilating themselves and expunging the system. This is true of some power in individually or multiusely expressed in relation to the one father power. So as with the physical universe, we can say that the arithmetical universe derives from God. And as uh, Brother Thomas said, one is the great power of this arithmetical uh, universe. Now today, mathematicians uh, regard set theory uh, as being at the foundation uh, of mathematics, most mathemat uh, mathematicians do anyway. And as this particular definition from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says, set theory has become the standard foundation for mathematics, as every mathematical object can be viewed as a set and every theorem of mathematics can be logically deduced in a predicate calculus from the axioms of set theory. Now, an example in scripture of where a set or group is plainly indicated by an albeit unstated number is in Jeremiah 44, 28. This says, yet a small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. 
Now here, uh, the word number refers to a set or a group of people, those that escape the sword, and the phrase a small number could be replaced with an actual number. In some descriptions of the fundamental building blocks of numbers and arithmetic, a key foundation stone is said to be the so-called empty set corresponding to zero. But as God is one, it seems wiser for a scriptural perspective to regard the number one as a key foundation. This is what Brother Thomas advocated, as we have already seen, um, when he stated one is the great power of the arithmetical universe and all the other powers resulting from the multiplication of one combined cannot exclude one therefrom without annihilating themselves and expunging um, the system. From the mention of one in Genesis 1 verse 5 and verse 9, where in the latter case God spoke this uh, number during creation, we can conclude the following. The number one is the first number mentioned in scripture. The number one is the first number mentioned by God in direct speech um, in scripture when he said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. Numbers were mentioned before man was created. Therefore, numbers are not a human construct. The number one is the foundation for numbers in the light of scripture, not zero or an empty set. Now let's return to the numbers in Genesis 1. There may be a temptation to, uh, to play these numbers down as they seem so simple. What we hope to show is that given the context of what they relate to, they are extremely precise. The use of mathematics is a hallmark of modern scientific uh, writing and work. Newton's work, uh, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, was a seminal work in this respect. It brought, uh, it brought together science and mathematics in a way which greatly increased the understanding of how mathematics can be used to describe and explain the natural world. The work is replete with mathematical reasoning. The same is true of scientific writing today, where often complex and deep mathematics are harnessed to describe and analyze the natural world. Compared with scientific writing, the use of numbers in Genesis 1 may seem simplistic, naive and lacking in rigor. However, this is far from the case. Consider for a moment the example of the formation of an oxbow lake. These are bodies of water which form when the bend in the meandering river gets cut off. Let's ask the question, how long to the nearest day does it take for oxbow lakes to form? This process takes from a few years to several decades. It would be very difficult to identify the exact day the process begins and ends. In any case, there is no benefit in knowing the length of time for this process to that level of precision. No geographer or geologist would generally use the time scale of days to measure the time taken for an oxbow lake to form. The question asking how many days an oxbow lake takes to form is inappropriate. Instead, it would be better to ask, how long to the nearest year does it take for oxbow lakes to form? Now let's consider another example. How long to the nearest day did it take for dry land to appear on earth and for plant life to be made? This question concerns events which are far more complex and of a much greater order of magnitude than the formation of an oxbow lake. Based on the example of the Oxbow Lake, surely a day is not an appropriate timescale in this instance. The information to answer the question is found, of course, in Genesis 1. Verses 9 to 13 say, And God said, 
Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. The seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So the answer to the question, how long to the nearest day did it take for dry land to appear on earth and for plant life to be made is, of course, one day. Given the scale of what takes place uh, on this day, it is an amazingly precise number. The simplicity of the answer should not detract from its precision. Compared with the complexity of what was done, this simplicity serves to indicate the greatness of the power involved in the creative process. Isaiah 40 verse 12 speaks of God's use of number during creation, specifically with regard to measuring. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in the measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? This, verb uses four, uh, this verse uses four verbs relating to measuring, measured, meted, comprehended and weighed. This verse not only gives indication of God's power in being able to measure such things as the heavens, dust, mountains and hills, but also it shows the amazing precision and knowledge involved in creation. Weighing in scales and balancing is analogous to the use of equations in mathematics. Equation-like statements are found in the Bible. For example, in the Revelation 21 verse 16 it says, And the city lieth foursquare, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So this could be expressed as an equation. Length equals breadth equals height, which equals 12,000 uh, furlongs. Another example is in Ezekiel uh, chapter 45, verse 11. The ether and the bath shall be of one measure, that the bath may contain the tenth part of an homer and the ether the part, tenth part of an homer the measure thereof shall be one after the homer so based on that we can uh, put together these equations a bath equals a tenth of a homer uh, and an ether equals a tenth of a homer or 0.1 uh, times a homer equations have been described uh, as things of beauty not least of course euler's uh, identity uh, equation Man is right to appreciate the beauty of equations and the way that the natural world can be represented in a balanced way. A just weight is his delight, it says in Proverbs. And later on, a just weight and balance are Yahweh's. All the weights of the bag are in his, uh, in his work, or his work. There are se several uh, mentions of in the Bible of God's ability to number things, an ability which lay behind the creative work in Genesis 1. For example, Job 38 verse uh, 37 says, who can number the clouds in wisdom? Job 39 verses 1 and 2 speaks particularly of God knowing time uh, and numbering. Who can number the clouds? Uh, who knowest thou at the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do carve? Canst thou number the months they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bring forth? In Matthew 10, verse 30, Christ says that God knows the number of our hair, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Psalm 147 verse 4 speaks of how God can count the stars. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. But as well as being numbered, as we see, each star has a name, showing the intimate knowledge 
and care God has for his creation. The same care and attention to detail is seen in the numbering, for example, of the children of Israel, where Moses, in Numbers 1 verse 2, was commanded to take the number of their names. In Genesis 15, God challenges Abraham to number the stars. Here, the English tell and number translate the same Hebrew verb, so far. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. The English verb to tell can have the sense of numbering. For example, in a sentence such as, all told, there were 20 people there. There are also bank tellers who count money and tellers who count votes. But just as the English verb to tell also has the sense of speaking, so too with the Hebrew uh, word so far. So in Genesis 24, verse 66, we read, and the servant told so far East Isaac all things that he had done. The same verb is translated declare in Psalm 19 um, and verse one, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Here it seems both senses of the verb apply. The heavens declare and number the glory of God. Let's now consider approximations in scripture. These are important in mathematics as well as occurring in the Bible. We will consider some examples and then reflect on their use or lack of use in Genesis 1. In Matthew 14, verse 21, it says, And they, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men. Here, the number is not exactly 5,000, but about 5,000. In John 16, uh, John 6, and verse 19, we we read, so when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. So here the number of furlongs is approximated to between twenty-five and thirty furlongs. Approximations are also used of time. In Luke 23 and verse 44, uh, we read, and it was about the sixth hour, and there, there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. So here we see that it says it was about the sixth hour, not exactly the sixth hour. Again, in Acts, Acts 10, verse 3, he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. In both verses, time is given uh, as an approximation. Now, approximation, uh, as we said, it, it is an important uh, feature of mathematics and, and applied mathematics, and we also find it in scripture. But in Genesis 1, the numbers are manifestly precise. The numbers are not approximate. Numbers are not prefaced with words like about. Approximation is used in scripture, but not in Genesis 1. The same is true of Exodus 20, verse 11, which says, For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, not in about six days. Well, now let's move on to the second part of the talk, which concerns time in Genesis 1. Although Brother Thomas regarded the earth as existing before the events of Genesis 1, he interpreted the days in Genesis 1 as those periods of time which uh, go up, go put together, make up uh, a week, seven days of a week. As you wrote in Elpis Israel, the six days of Genesis were unquestionably six diurnal revolutions of the earth upon its axis. This is clear from the tenor of the Sabbath law. Six days shalt thou labor, O Israel, and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. 
So here, uh, Brother Thomas uh, speaks of a diurnal revolutions, where diurnal just means um, daily. Um, and as we see, he quotes from Genesis 20, which we quoted from uh, just, uh, just now. So Brother Thomas clearly regarded, um, clearly stated that he regarded um, the days in Genesis 1 as 24, uh, roughly 24-hour periods. Now, this interpretation reflects the language of Genesis 1, where terms such as day, night, evening, and morning indicate a roughly 24-hour day, as we understand it. Furthermore, the wording in Genesis 1 indicates that both the divine commands and their execution were carried out on the same day. The statements about time, speaking of evening, morning, and day, follow both command and execution. There is no indication in the text that the commands on a given day were executed at a time after that day. As Psalm 33 uh, verse 9 says, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. In his book, A Drama of Creation, Brother Alan Fowler uh, wrote the following. At first reading, it may seem to our Western minds to be a straightforward account of the creation of the earth and of the universe within a period of six literal days. So he's speaking here about um, uh, Genesis chapter one. Now, we would agree with this statement to a certain extent. Although I'm sure other minds, other than Western minds, would also surely agree that Genesis one is a straightforward account of the creation of the earth and of the universe the period of six literal days. Now, Brother Fowler, as his book shows, did not believe this interpretation. But the key thing here is that his quotation is evidence, if it was needed, that the interpretation that the days are six literal days in Genesis 1 is not something which has to be forced onto the text. Most would agree with Brother Fowler's um, assessment. Exodus 20, verse 11, as we've seen, plainly states that indeed, indeed Genesis 1 is a straightforward account of the creation of the earth and of the universe within the period of six literal days. This is the correct interpretation. Now, creation was day by day, uh, a day by day creative process is spoken of in Proverbs 8, where wisdom is personified to speak how she was there during the days of creation. So Proverbs 8, verses 27 to verse 30 uh, state, When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea his decree that the waters should not pass, his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So uh, we would suggest that um, wisdom, the way which wisdom was, was with God on a daily basis, uh, was that on each of those days of creation um, in Genesis 1, um, God was uh, drawing on his wisdom to uh, create the heavens and earth through his angels, of course. Now, in Genesis 1, verse 5, the Hebrew for first is akad, which is usually translated as one. For example, it is translated that way in Genesis 1, verse 9. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, um, and it was so. However, at least in the AV, it is translated first, again, in Genesis 2, and verse 11. In the Young's literal translation, it is rendered one in both Genesis 1, uh, 5 and Genesis 2, 11. So verse 5, so he says, that God, he translated it as God calleth to, and God calleth to the light day and to the darkness he hath called night. And there was an evening and there was a morning day one. And then Genesis 2, verse 11 says the name of the one is uh, Pison. The usual Old Testament Hebrew word for first is Rishon. Both Echad and Rishon occurred together, for example, in 1 Kings 18, verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one, Echad, bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, Rishon, for you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. 
Here, the word ekad clearly has the sense of one. The word was shown is used in time context. For example, in Exodus 12, 15, where it is used of a day. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. Rishon could have been used in Genesis 1 for verse 5, but Echad was chosen, chosen. Why might this be? It might be responded that day one is called that and not first day because it was not really the first ever day. This may be the case, but it need not commit us to believing there were previous earth days. In Deuteronomy 11 verse 21, we read, that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which Yahweh swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. So we have this phrase here, days of heaven. Find it again, Psalm 89. His seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Now, how long is a day of heaven relative to, for example, earth days? It's not revealed, but these verses show that such days exist and would have existed presumably even before the earth was created. So in that sense, day one in Genesis 1 was not the first day. Now let's have another look at Genesis 1 verse 5 with regard to its uh, translation. The Hebrew for was actually occur occurs twice with one verb attached to evening and the other to morning. So, following the AB margin, it can be rendered as, and the evening was, and the morning was. Combining this with uh, the Young's rendering of Echad um, gives us the following, and the evening was, and the morning was, day one. This re rendering seems stilted and a little bit like a list, but actually, according to one possible interpretation, it appropriately fits with the rest of the verse um, as follows. Here is a diagram with uh, the day followed by night. Evening is placed at the end of the day and at the beginning of the night. And morning is placed at the beginning of the day and at the end of the night. Now in what follows, we will assume that a day begins with daytime and ends with nighttime. This would ordinarily not seem controversial, but it is contrary to Jewish tradition, which says the day begins with the night. This tradition is followed by many when interpreting Genesis 1. But as will be seen, regarding daytime as coming first with the morning at the beginning of the day seems to fit better with the text. Now let's apply this model to day one. The light was created during what was uh, daytime, once the, the light came. That was followed by evening. And then that was followed by morning, with the nighttime not being included um, in, in the summary of the, in the verses. Altogether, these constituted day one. Now let's apply this model to the second day. During the day, the firmament um, was created. That was followed by evening. Again, night is not mentioned in the record. Then came morning, and the morning was. Altogether, these constituted the second day. So um, this way of looking um, at, the, at the text and, and the mention of terms such as morning and evening um, helps to explain uh, the phraseology uh, with mention of evening, morning, um, and then the summary, uh, second day for uh, day one, third day, or whatever, at the, uh, at the end of each uh, uh, section with regard to a particular day. We can now turn our attention to how so much was done in the space of six days. Now, it's important to remember as a previous talk has showed, that creation was a miracle. It was not constrained by natural processes, and where natural processes were at work, it was possible for those to miraculously occur at a faster rate than would naturally be the case. In this regard, Isaiah 60, verse 22, um, is helpful. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation, I, Yahweh, will hasten it 
in his time. Now, this is what happened during the creation week. In the time given over to creation, that is six days, God hastened things. Let's now um, consider some of the events of day three. Now, Genesis 1, verses 12 to 13, uh, says the following. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. How can we explain this all happening in one day? Now, a helpful passage to compare this with is Jonah chapter 4. Here we, we read of a plant growing up overnight. Verse 6 says, And Yahweh God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Clearly, this was a miracle. The plant grew at a rate overnight to the extent that it was tall enough to shelter Jonah. No plant naturally grows this fast. Even certain bamboo species, which are some of the fastest growing plants, reach no more than around 90 centimeters in a, in a day. In the language of Isaiah, God had hastened it in his time. In verse 10, we read, Then said Yahweh, thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not laboured, neither made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. The AV margin gives the more literal rendering of the Hebrew for which came up in the night as which was the sun of the night. In the language of Jonah, the grass, herbage and trees in Genesis 1 were the sons of the day. Now, at this point, it would be as well to deal with a quotation from an article by Brother A.D. Norris from the Christadelphian magazine um, in December 1964. In this quotation, he wrote about the phrase, let the earth bring forth in Genesis 1 verse 11. I've recently heard this used in a Christadelphian talk on creation in a way which seemed to allow for the possibility, at least, of some form of the theistic evolution. So let's just have a look at this uh, statement here. That the words of Genesis 1 in relation to kinds do not suggest any sort of evolution is perfectly true. But it is obvious that if the words are to be pressed at all, the additional words, let the earth bring forth, must be given equal attention. While these words also do not suggest how the earth was to bring forth its living burden, they do not exclude any mechanism consistent with the process occurring according to the will of God. As far as the words themselves go, they are as consistent with an evolutionary mechanism as with any other, providing that the guiding and directing hand of God in the matter um, is preserved. But Genesis 1 verse 11 is speaking unequivocally about growth, not evolution. The Hebrew for bring forth, Dasha, is used in Joel 2, verse 22, where it's clearly speaking of growth. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, Dasha, for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. In Genesis 1, 11, the earth brought forth by creation and rapid growth in one day, not by evolution. Now let's consider time in relation to the creation of the sun, moon and stars on the fourth day. And uh, we can read about this in verses 14 to 19 in Genesis 1. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for years, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light toward the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the uh, fourth day. First, we need to establish the scope of the word firmament here. Whatever the firmament is, the sun 
moon and stars are in it. The term firmament here is thus referring to space. In Genesis 1.20 we read, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now the Hebrew for open firmament of heaven, as the AB margin indicates, is more accurately rendered the face of the firmament of heaven. This is where the birds fly, that is, the atmosphere. So the firmament is space. And the atmosphere is the face of the firmament. The Lord Jesus used similar language when he said, Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky or heaven as it uh, should be rendered. The scope of the record of the creation of the sun, moon and stars, therefore, includes space. Given the distances involved and the time taken for light to travel, this poses a problem. How did stars and other objects become visible on the fourth day when the nearest star is over four light years away. And how today is it possible to observe across the ele electromagnetic spectrum, not just visible light, objects which are in some cases billions of light years away. Now one solution is that the sun, moon and stars already existed before the six days of Genesis 1. But this runs counter to what Genesis 1 appears uh, to be saying. That is, it, it, to use the words of Brother Fowler, it's a straightforward account of the creation of the earth and of the universe uh, within a period of six literal days. We must, of course, try to conform whatever explanation we come up with to the Bible. And we should not be tempted to conform to scientific theory where that contradicts the Bible and is unproven. This is particularly important with regard to the influence of evolution. We perhaps do not always fully appreciate or choose to take full account of the influence evolution has on man's dating of the universe. Consider these two quotations. The first is from Arthur Eddington, an astronomer who played an important part in the popularization of Einstein's theory of relativity. He said, naturally, it is the policy of the evolutionist to grab as much time as possible in order to give his processes a longer opportunity to accomplish something. So, when there is no strong evidence one way or another, the longer time scale of the expansion of the universe gets the, pre the preference. Now let's look at these words from the cosmologist Sho Magisho. He said, we cannot hurry the uh, slow process by which natural selection cooks up intelligence. And in uh, only one class of cosmological models do we have the necessary time. Now, it's important to emphasize that in uh, neither cases uh, were the shorter timescales being rejected, anything like short enough to fit it with a recent six-day uh, creation. The point we are making by uh, giving these quotations is to show the influence biological evolution is having on the models cosmologists, or in the case of Ellington, astronomers, choose. From the truth's perspective, our models and interpretations need to be constrained not by how long is needed for biology to evolve intelligence, but rather by the historical record in the Bible. It really is important for us um, it's good stuff is to understand that um, a, a lot of the, um, the models and, and the dating that goes into the universe is not set in stone um, and it is heavily influenced by uh, the requirements of uh, biological evolutionary theory. The incident of the gourd in the prophecy of Jonah provides a way of understanding what happened on the fourth day. Just as a gourd was made to grow at a faster rate than normal overnight to project Jonah, so on the fourth day, the natural processes, together with the creative acts, must have worked at a faster rate than normal. If a film would be made of a gourd growing, then playing the film back at a slower speed would show the gourd growing at a normal rate. Did the natural processes on the fourth day work at a faster rate? together with a faster speed of light. Then was the speed of light lowered to its current speed so that faster than normal processes appear now to be happening at a normal rate. Now, there is a problem, however, with assuming uh, that light initially, for example, was traveling at infinite speed 
or at near infinite speed to enable light to reach the earth on the fourth day. To illustrate the problem, let's assume that light initially travelled at an infinite speed so that a given star would be seen instantaneously on the earth on the fourth day. If this was the case, then at some point, the speed of light would be reduced to its current speed. At this point, the light already travelling across the universe at, instantane at infinite speed would also need to be slowed down. Otherwise, the star would not be seen until the light travelling at the slower speed reached the Earth. However, the light which had previously been travelling at infinite speed would contain the same image of the star, so that what would be seen from Earth would essentially be a snapshot or, as it were, a still photograph. So, for example, if it was a variable star, no changes would show. Only when the light emitted at finite speed arrived would things be seen in real time. So this has its problems and does not seem to be correct. Now, whatever the explanation, it probably involves variations in the speed of light. Now, we should not be concerned about this. That the speed of light might not have always had the same speed is now uh, today propounded by some mainstream scientists. Cosmo the cosmologist we previously quoted is a leading exponent of this possibility. As we saw earlier, Brother Thomas wrote that the six days of Genesis were unquestionably six diurnal revolutions of the Earth upon its axis. Bearing, bearing this in mind, during creation, regardless of the extent to which things in the firmament of the heavens were hastened, and regardless of the way time may have run differently from that on earth relative to the earth, the creative acts in the firmament took no longer than the six diurnal days of creation. Any calculation of timings of creation in the firmament must conform to the six diurnal revolutions of the earth on its axis to be consistent with Genesis 1. Now, a scriptural approach to understanding this is to use verses such as that found in Psalm 90 and verse 4, which states, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So, uh, we can see uh, from this verse that a day in God's sight is like a thousand years and a watch is like a thousand years. Now, using this information, it is quite straightforward to get from six days to a time reminiscent of that usually ascribed to the time taken for light to travel from the furthest known parts of the universe to Earth. The calculations which follow are not primarily my own, but based on other work I've come across on this topic uh, a few years ago in recent years. The key point to remember is that the six diurnal days of creation are fixed, but during this time, it was as though a lot more time was passing in terms of the acts of creation being carried out, particularly in the uh, firmament of the heavens. So first of all, we just need to uh, look at watches. Now, there are two types of uh, watches of the night in Scripture. In the Old Testament, there are three watches. Each of these would last four hours. In other words, 12 hours of night, uh, we'll assume, divided by uh, three, give us four, three lots of four hours. In the New Testament, there are four watches. Each of these would last three hours. Now, in what follows... We make the following assumptions. First of all, a day, the term day is taken to refer to not just daytime, but night as well. So to a 24 hour period, 24 hour day. We'll assume a year is exactly 365 days, which obviously is, is an approximation, but that's what we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll run with, with this cal these calculations. Uh, and thirdly, we will assume that the watch um, or the watch we will use is an Old Testament watch, uh, which is a uh, watch of the night, which uh, lasted uh, four hours. Now, in a 24 hour day, if you've got a, a, a divide 24 by four, basically um, to get a 24 hour period, that's equivalent to 
six watches. Now remember, what we're trying to do is to uh, show that those six days of, uh, or to show how the six days of creation uh, in God's sight um, were equivalent in terms of the things he can do in that time uh, to um, time periods more usually associated um, uh, with uh, cosmological uh, time scales. So a couple of steps then. First of all, step uh, one. First, let's um, convert the six days of creation to watches. Um, so we know that one day is a thousand years in God's sight. Therefore, six days is 6,000 years. Now, converting the 6,000 6, years into watches, that gives us 6,000 times 365, that's the days, times six, because there's six watches uh, per day. And this gives us um, 13,140,000 watches. So we're already getting to quite a, a high number of watches just from the, these ba this basic step. Now, step two, we know uh, from Psalm 90 that God's eyes, one watch is as a thousand years. Therefore, uh, 13,140,000 watches is as uh, this number times a thousand, which gives us 13.14 uh, billion um, years. So in a relatively few steps, a uh, few calculations, using um, the, the scriptures uh, of the fact that what is written in scripture concerning days in God's eye, sight, um, a day is like a thousand years and a watch is like a thousand years. We've arrived at this period of time of 13.14 uh, billion um, years. Now, although we would not want to make too much um, of this, after all, the steps we took, although based on scripture, were arbitrary. Nevertheless, one of the most distant objects yet discovered, um, this uh, galaxy I've got on the screen, is around 13.3 billion light years from Earth. Very similar, of course, to the 13.14 billion years which we calculated. Now, of course, God will be able to bring the light from this source to the earth during creation week because a day is as a thousand years and um, so is a watch. So whatever the explanation uh, for um, the fact that we can see um, things billions of years uh, of light years away, um, which according to Genesis, were plain reading of Genesis 1 were created, during those six days of creation, whatever the ex explanation, the ultimate explanation from our perspective is that nothing is impossible with God and that God, um, that creation was uh, miraculous. But we can see just by those a few steps that we've uh, uh, carried out, that we can see how it is that in God's eyes, those six days, from God's perspective, actually, uh, those six days in his sight were um, just as... Uh, no different in, the, in terms of the things you could do to a 13 over 13 billion year uh, billion years or put the other way 13 billion years of work god if he chose could do that in a few days and that's what happened um as recorded in genesis chapter one now there are many other things that we could uh, consider many other questions to ask uh, we could ask with regard to uh, time in genesis one for example what happened to the light from day one after the sun moon and stars were created so for example is the cosmic microwave background a, a relic not of a big bang but visible light created on day one and stretched to microwaves when god presumably on the fourth day stretch forth the heavens as spoken of for example in isaiah 51 and many of the verses too in ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11 we read but time and chance or occurrence happeneth to all now time began happening to man man after adam sinned and he became mortal and the occur the occurrence of course which ecclesiastes is speaking of is death but time also happens to matter e.g rust doth corrupt as it says in Matthew 
six. So when did this begin? When Adam sinned from the, from the moment of creation? What impact would this have? Um, and, and especially if it wasn't uh, the case to begin with on such, such things as radioactive um, uh, decay. So these are just some of the many questions that, we, that can be looked at with regard to time in Genesis chapter 1. So um, in conclusion, what have we uh, looked at in this talk? First of all, we've seen that God is one and he is the originator of numbers and mathematics. The numbers used of time in Genesis 1 are amazingly precise, given what they are talking about. The six days of creation in Genesis 1 are six diurnal revolutions of the earth. The execution of a command of creation took place on the same day as the command. During creation, God hastened things. And the creation of the sun, moon and stars took place during the six days of creation, but was hastened so that the work done corresponded to uh, many billions of years. Well, I hope you found that um, uh, talk useful and gives you plenty of uh, give you, gives you plenty of uh, food for thought and thinking about um, issues to do with both numbers um, and time in Genesis chapter one.